First of all, okay, this is the first, the first class of the season, so some clarifications are in place. Uh, the title of the course is Algorithms, so those who are here by mistake, this is a good time for you to leave. Uh, and my name, since even this, there are two courses offered by the same title, so, so this is my name. And so now comes your first exercise, is absolutely compulsory, is that based on this data, find the class website. Okay, just a show of hands, how many of you have already found it? Excellent, super, okay, that's, I like the initiative. Um, okay, so what is, um, well, I don't want to do much administration because basically everything you can find on the website. Check it out, and if there are questions, okay, make sure you ask them either by email or ask them in next class. On the website, you will see that this is going to be the text that is associated with the class, and this is the recommended text. Last year, this text was the text, so probably you can uh, get some discounted copies from students who took this class last year. Okay, all right, so this this about 3,000 pages, that's what we are going to cover this quarter. And uh, <clears throat> plus there will be a lot of uh, uh, web-based handouts, so, and, and I'm not following any text, so class participation, the attendance is very important. Your notes will be your primary text, and so if you miss a class, make sure you know somebody in class from whom you can take the uh, notes and copy them and, and uh, discuss whatever is, is not clear. There are other administrative things. I don't have an, a, a specific time for office hours, but I am always available. If you want to talk to me, then please send me email and, uh, um, and then we uh, agree on a time or I just simply respond uh, by email. Uh, do take advantage of the TA's office hours, okay, which are Wednesday afternoon and it's posted also on the website. Um, and, oh, I'm sorry, no, that's not, it's on Monday, that's, that's uh, sorry. Wednesday afternoons are, are uh, we, have, we have tutorials and that's where we discuss, uh, uh, discuss problems that have been assigned and tests. Um, we shall have such a tutorial even tomorrow, even though no problems will yet be due, so uh, do not miss that. But later on it will be absolutely critical because in class we do not have the time to discuss uh, all the homework assignments and test problems. So problem solving, creative problem solving is, is a central part of, of this course. Uh, this is not a programming course. Programming background is not assumed. However, some basic understanding of the cycle structure of how programs run is helpful because one of the skills that we need to acquire during this class it will be pseudocode descriptions of the algorithms. A pseudocode can have a lot of English phrases in it, but the one thing that has to be accurate is the cycle structure of the algorithm, the while loops, the for loops, and, and that's, that's, that's what, what can bring tremendous clarity and elegance to, to the algorithms when described in pseudocode as opposed to just in flowing text. Okay, all right. So this will be a heavily mathematical course. We are going to set up exact models of computation, discuss algorithms in these models, and then prove theorems about them. The theorems are two kinds. One is the algorithm actually does what it is supposed to do, so program verification basically, and the second is, uh, and that's the main subject really, complexity analysis. So how, many, how much resources does the algorithm use, whatever resources we have in mind. Now, <clears throat> the first thing is then a, an abstract model of computation Okay, so this involves defining elementary steps. Okay, so what kind of things can we do in a single step? So for instance, in comparison-based sorting, we have n objects, 
and we want to sort them, say, by weight, then what we can do is we can pick up two of them and then ask, okay, which one is heavier? That's the only type of question, okay? So then in a sequence of steps of this sort, we need to be able to sort all our data, okay? Or, for instance, if we want to multiply two matrices over the complex numbers, then we could say that, all right, take two complex numbers and perform some arithmetic operation over them, addition or multiplication, that's one elementary step, okay? We are talking about abstract models, so don't worry about what it means to even define a complex number. <laughs> what is it? Uh, well, we talk about abstract models and, and, and the relevance. The relevance is something that is, is, is an issue. Uh, we always try to pick the central, the key aspects of the problem to get a mathematical simplification and this mathematical simplification then permits us a treatment that tells us important basic <coughs> facts about the nature of computation. So we define elementary steps, that's part of the model, and then we associate costs with each elementary step. So for instance, in the example of matrix multiplication, we may say that at one unit cost, we can add two complex numbers, and at one unit cost, we can multiply two complex numbers. However, it has been found that it is quite reasonable to simply ignore the cost of addition and look at only the cost of multiplication. And somehow, if we are able to, pro, uh, to, to find procedures which, which economize on just that cost, it will actually lead to an overall economic performance. Um, also, another question is optimality of our algorithms. Okay, so for that purpose, we need to prove lower bounds. We need to show that in the given model of computation, it is not possible to perform a particular computational task in fewer, at, at lower cost than, than some, some particular bound. Uh, this is usually a very difficult task because what we are up against is not one particular algorithm, but all conceivable algorithms, mechanical procedures that work on that model, all possible sequences of elementary steps. So we have to find some invariance that, on which we can base such lower bounds. But lower, the knowledge in computer science about lower bounds is extremely limited. And, and so uh, finding good lower bounds is the central subject of the theory of computing. We are not going to go into details about this. We are going to see only a small number of, um, of very simple examples. Okay? Now, the mathematical background. Discrete mathematics is a prerequisite Not any discrete math course that you may have taken at some other college or wherever, but the one that I taught last quarter. If, if, uh, if, you, can, if you didn't take it, then you, you can check it. It's, uh, all the assignments, homework, and tests are posted on the website. <clears throat> and uh, and uh, if, you, uh, if you feel that you are up to it, you can, I, I, I am offering a placement test, so you can come to me and I give you something that's equivalent to the final exam of that. And, and, and then, then we can decide how to, how to proceed. Okay, <clears throat> so the specific subjects uh, that, that, that will be useful include number theory, asymptotic notation, oh, I, 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 I should start with the elements of logic. Uh, the quantifier notation. Uh, then graph theory, finite probability spaces, counting, and probably a few others that I have missed, but th these subjects, uh, now, as a first, I want to emphasize asymptotic notation, which is going to be uh, bread and butter for this course from the very beginning, uh, so immediately. And so you, you need to check that out. But number theory is also coming soon behind it, and, and so does discrete probability. <clears throat> okay. 
All right. So let me then jump into the middle and, and, and give an illustration of what it means to define a mathematical model to, to define a computational task and, and to, to, to find an algorithm for it and analyze it. Okay? All of that. And uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to illustrate this on an imagined uh, database. <clears throat> which is somehow <clears throat> located on the North Pole in, inside the humongous compu computer. And my idea is that this, this, this uh, machine here stores a ton of data and uh, the weight equivalent of one piece of one item of data would be <clears throat> uh, would be a water molecule. So as many as there fit water molecules in a ton, that's how many items of data we are going to store. Uh, that's going to be the number of bytes. So number of water molecules is going to be the number of bytes. All right, so if you know your Avogadro number and a few other things, then you can calculate that this is roughly 2.3 times 10 to the 29 bytes. Okay? So we assume that that's the amount of data that we store there. And now there is a mirror site on the down, on the south pole for this computer that is supposed to store the precise same data. So it is the exact same. <clears throat> A string of this many bytes. <clears throat> okay? All right. So <clears throat> uh, it is very important. So let's, let's, uh, we, can view, we can view the data as a string. So x is a string of zeros and uh, ones. So it's a zero, one string of lengths. Well, if a byte is 8 bit, then it's 8 times 2.3 times 10 to the 29 bits. Okay? So that's the string x. And that is string y here, which is supposed to be the same as x. Okay? That's a mirror side. So mm, uh, y should equal x. Okay? All right. Now it seems that that may be a vulnerability in the world structure, and <clears throat> and at some point, uh, an armada of little green men somehow approached the Earth and and sent some malicious rays toward these points of vulnerability that change a few bits here and there. Nobody knows how many bits have been changed. And then, <clears throat> then, they, <clears throat> then they put an intellectual challenge to the earthlings, which is to establish whether x is equal to y now. OK? So, <clears throat> Those on the Earth should be able to compare. Now there is a modified string X and a modified string Y here. Okay, so we have two strings. They could be equal. They could be not equal. They could be different um, uh, tremendously, or they could differ in just a single bit. And that's the only question the aliens ask. They ask, is X equal to Y? Okay. And of course, as pesky aliens like that tend to do, they say, if you give the wrong answer, we destroy the Earth. Okay. All right, so it seems to be in the interest of the computer science society uh, community of the world and, and also other members uh, to actually give the correct answer. Well, okay, so one way of giving the correct answer would be to somehow compare them bit by bit. So what that requires is nothing more than communication. So here is a modem, I guess, or something. And, and here is another one. Now, I need to introduce some technical terminology. X is 
uh, uh, the, the computer that holds x is called Alice, and the computer that holds y is called Bob. This is, tech this is technical terminology. So <clears throat> although I am going to refer to them as she and he, you, can, you have to think of them as processors, which means, I guess, it. Uh, all right, so and they communicate somehow. Now suppose that they have ex extremely advanced uh, uh, optical links that are capable of communicating one terabyte per second. Who knows what's a terabyte? Yes? How many bytes is that? Nobody? Okay, yes? It's more than that. Okay, look it up, okay? Good. So, so suppose that we have that many bytes per second. I mean, that's, that's way beyond any capabilities of today. But uh, if, if, if we uh, compute there are 30 million seconds per year, it will take roughly 100 million years. To transmit x and uh, send it to the other side. So the assumption in this model is that local computation is free and the only thing that counts is bits that are being communicated. So that's our model of computation. We are allowed to send bits of information between Alice and Bob. We are allowed to send it back and forth. Both of them can send things. Uh, and local computation is free. So maybe, maybe Alice and Bob don't want to send all of X or all of y to the other side because that is hopelessly slow. The little green men are not going to wait that long. Um, <clears throat> remember that that many years ago dinosaurs were ruling the earth. So <clears throat> instead they, they take some tricky aggregates of their bits and then send it to the other side and then the other side computes something based on the, already on the history of communication plus what they see as their own part of the input. So there is a back and forth in this, which is, which is, which is very much like, like uh, bidding in bridge, okay? The two partners ignore east and west, there is only north and south, and, 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 and then they communicate and somehow they wish to gain as much information about the hand of the other as possible, okay? And, and, uh, and they speak in code, okay? So if they say that, I don't know, uh, two of hearts, it doesn't mean that they have any strengths in hearts. They, that means that they previously agreed on a communication protocol by which two of hearts means that I have at least two aces and some strengths in whatever, okay? I mean, there are these huge books of, of bidding in bridge where, uh, where you can agree in advance and we can assume that actually the world was prepared for this kind of attack and they already have these books and both Alice are, and, uh, and, and, uh, and Bob are, are fully aware of the right bidding system. And so now the question is, how many bits would they need to communicate to actually get an answer to this question? Okay, so this model of computation uh, is called communication complexity. And the essence of this is uh, that the input is split into two, okay, x and y, and we need to compute so each of these are strings of length n, and, and we must compute some Boolean function f of x, y. So the result is 0 or 1. And these are 0, 1 strings of length capital N, where capital N is that humongous number, and, and then, then, then they must compute. And the only cost is the number of bits communicated. Okay? So that's what we want to minimize. Okay? So local computation is free. Obviously, this is not 
realistic because local computation is never free. However, nevertheless, this model actually uh, uh, models a tremendous number of, of, uh, of situations both in theoretical computer science and in practical computing in particular. It was initially introduced in order to study uh, VLSI, so, so chips, where communication is a big problem, okay? Imagine that we have an input that is spread over a chip, then this part of the chip needs to communicate with that part of the chip. So that tells us, um, if we have a lower bound, how much communication must happen between the two parts, and from that it is possible to derive lower bounds that, uh, that describe a time and area trade-off. Okay, if we have more time, we, we, we can do it in a smaller area and vice versa for, for computation on VLSI. So, so this actually does model uh, computational situations and, and, it, uh, and, uh, and many more quite unexpected ways it models uh, uh, situations that arise in other mo theoretical models of computation. Okay, all right, so this model was introduced by Yao in 1979, around, and, and, and has become very popular and, and fundamental to, uh, to the theory of computing. Okay, so now one of the things that we can associate with such a, a computational task is a matrix. It's a 2 to the n by 2 to the n matrix, which can be labeled by the strings x and strings y, and here in this entry we put f of x and y. Okay, so the rows corresponds to the input held by Alice, the columns correspond to the input held by Bob, and the corresponding entry to this row and column is the value of the function that we want to compute uh, for <coughs> uh, this pair of inputs. Okay. So let me call this matrix M sub F. Why is it a two to the capital N by two to the capital N matrix? Why is the size, why is the dimension of the matrix this big? Because what is X? Yes? X is a, X is a string of length capital N over the binary alphabet. So there are two to the capital N possibilities for X and similarly two to the capital. So it's a huge matrix. I mean, imagine n is that big, how big is this matrix, right? Okay, and now there is a theorem. <coughs> uh, I believe by Mailhorn and Schmidt, which says that the communication complexity, let me denote it by this, this is the communication complexity, so this is the number of bits communicated in the, in the best pr procedure. of the function f is greater than or equal to the base two logarithm of the rank of this matrix. This is quite a remarkable uh, connection to linear algebra, but we have this lower bound, okay? So that's a theorem, and now let's see how this theorem applies to our situation. Suppose f is now the equality function. So this means f of x, y is equal to 1 if x is equal to y, and 0 if x is not equal to y. So in this case, what is the matrix? So what is the matrix of equality? Corey? It is the identity matrix. So it is the identity matrix of size 2 to the n by 2 to the n. Okay? What is the rank of that matrix? Yes? It's 2 to the n. So what does that tell us about the communication complexity of equality? greater than or equal to the base 2 logarithm of 2 to the n, which is n. So we cannot possibly get 
even a single bit of savings over the obvious protocol that Alice would send all the bits to Bob, okay? If Alice sends all the bits to Bob, then of course Bob can compare the two and, and Bob knows the answer, yes or no, so the world knows the answer. Uh, <clears throat> that costs capital N bits. And what this theorem says, that no matter how cleverly they communicate, based on whatever difficult bidding scheme, it is not possible to save even a single bit. Okay? All right, so what this tells us in, in our, uh, um, you know, real world example is that, that, that the world is doomed. Okay? At best, they can count on their luck, right? Okay? What would be a possibility, possible way of exploiting a hope of luck? I'm sorry? Well, if there are, if you make a lucky guess. Please. Lucky guess, okay. So what is their chance of, of being lucky in their guess? Aaron? Oh, no, but the, you see the aliens can, can guess about your thinking. And if they guess that that's their thinking, then they make it very likely that they are equal. They change a few million bits here and there in such a way that they do become equal. They, they, they would certainly, uh, okay, I mean, they would be stupid not to think of this possible strategy and, and then they can easily undermine it, yeah? Yes? Right, we don't have a model of the alien thinking, right? We can just assume like the worst case. What's the worst case? Oh, well, no, no. What chance can we definitely achieve easily? 50-50 we can. We just flip a coin and then if it heads, we say they are equal. If they tails, then we say it's not equal, right? Okay, all right. So that's, that's, that's one way of, you know, uh, betting on your luck. And, and, um, and if, if, if we know nothing else, Okay, this, this method doesn't depend on our actual X and Y. So if, if we want to give an answer that doesn't depend on our input, okay, we have a 50-50% chance of, of, of actually winning, and, and it is easy to see that, that it cannot be any better than that. Uh, okay? <clears throat> All right, so 50-50 we can gain, but that's, of course, not acceptable. I mean, a survival chance of 50% for, 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 for humanity is not acceptable. So we should do something better, and, and what we are going to do is actually uh, we are going to set a threshold of 2 to the minus 500 for probability of error. Uh, the good thing about 2 to the 500 is that that's bigger than the number of particles in the universe. So this sounds like a pretty good sort of target uh, uh, tolerance for error, okay? Uh, the question is how to achieve this without actually communicating that many bits Okay, so we are going to achieve this with 1,400 bits of communication. Okay, so um, <clears throat> if, you go, if you go back in time to the time when there were modems that would be able to communicate 28 bytes per second, then it takes less than six seconds to communicate this much. Okay, well, we have that much time. The aliens are not going to be there in, be there in six seconds. Okay, and that's a kind of probability on which you can bet, okay? If that's the, that's, uh, so the, the, the chance of error then is, is uh, this is how you can model the chance of error. Imagine that if we have all the particles in the known universe and one of them is painted red, okay? And now I, I have sort of a laser gun which, which I shoot in a random direction and I hit it, okay? Now that's the chance, okay? So we can live with that chance, okay? Um, <clears throat> probably the chance is that I, I even survive to the end of this class is less than that. I, I, uh, no, no, I'm sorry. The chances that I don't survive are greater than that. That's what I meant. Yeah. No, no, that would, <laughs> that would, <laughs> that would be real bad. Uh, mm. Sorry, guys. <laughs> so, mm, uh, let's see. Okay, so how do we do this? Now, wait a minute. I mean, we have a theorem here which says that is 1,400 bits. I mean, we need 2.3 times 10 to the 29 bits. 
Uh, and there is a theorem which says that. So how can you, uh, that's a theorem, it's proven. Uh, if a theorem is proven, then, then, then you just can't beat it, right? I mean, uh, Euclid proved that there are infinitely many primes, and then that's it. That was the, that's the last word on that question. There are infinitely many, there is no disputing, because there was a proof. So how do we beat this? Well, we beat it, obviously, Okay, well, what can we change? We can change the theorem by strengthening the conclusion, well, not without strengthening the uh, assumption or changing it, weakening it. Okay, we change the model, okay? So in that model that, that, that I implicitly discussed here, we cannot achieve such a thing. But just a slight change of model, which actually implicitly already is referred to in that statement, okay? simply removes, this is about deterministic protocols. So if, if given the input, I can tell exactly what I am going to communicate, and then given on the history of communication, I can tell exactly what the next piece of communication will be, okay, then this lower bound is valid. It's not valid if we are allowed to randomize. So what does it mean we are allowed to randomize? Okay, Alice, can do computation before deciding what the next bit should be to communicate, and that computation now can involve flipping coins, okay? So Alice can gain valuable information by looking at just random coin flips. And they are so valuable that they absolutely drastically reduce the computation time. Now, so let me describe a protocol that achieves this. And it will actually be extremely simple in the sense that there will not be back and forth communication. Simply Alice communicates something to Bob. Bob does a little calculation and that's it. So it will be actually one way communication where we would not even need this result to show that it's absolutely straightforward that deterministically you would need to communicate everything. Even if you miss a single bit, then, then you can't reconstruct the string. So, <clears throat> okay, so here is the protocol which bears the names of Robin, Yao, and Simon. <coughs> and Simon is our Janus Simon here in this department. Uh, <coughs> so the, uh, the protocol describes what to communicate. So the first thing will be that Alice picks a random 700 bit prime number. That's how it begins. The prime we call P, and 700 bit means initial zeros are permitted. So it is just simply a, seven, a string of length 700 of zeros and ones, which if you read in binary, it gives you a prime number, okay? So from among all the how many uh, integers, how many integers have, can be described by such a string of 700 bits? Tim? Uh, right, so it's here, yeah, yeah, two to the 700. So out of those two to the 700 integers, well, a large, a, a considerable fraction are actually prime, and, and, and so we pick one at random. Okay, that's what Alice does. Now, Alice also interprets X. X is a string of humongous lengths, okay? 10 to the 29th, right? But you can interpret it as a number. It's zeros and ones, okay? So, <clears throat> interprets the string x as digits of an integer. Okay? And now computes x mod p. That's the smallest non-negative remainder that we get when, divide, when we divide x by p. And Alice communicates that to Bob. And Alice also communicates P to Bob. So these are the two pieces of information that Alice communicates to Bob. Now, what is the cost of this communication? Well, 
P, we decided, is a string of 700 bits. And what is the cost? Uh, what is this? It's also 700 bits, OK? Yeah, to avoid ambiguity, we, do, we put uh, in the initial zeros if there are any. So altogether, we are at the 1,400 bits, OK? And that's all the communication that there will be, OK? Now, what does Bob do? OK? Bob computes y mod b, y mod p, OK? Because Bob knows y. And now Bob knows P because P has been communicated to him. Okay? Okay? If X is congruent to Y mod P, let's say if X is not congruent to Y mod P, then Bob says, what is, going to, what is Bob going to say? They, he will say that they are not equal. And he's going to declare this triumphantly because he also has a proof that x is not equal to y. Obviously, if x is not congruent to y mod p, then x is not equal to y. Else, Bob still has to declare an answer. What is Bob going to say? Well, obviously, he's not going to say that they are not equal. They could be equal now. OK. So Bob will say x is equal to y. OK? But he should say this with a degree of uncertainty, right? Really, but what Bob would mean by this is that I bet x is equal to y. He's betting the life of the Earth on it, but let's see what are the chances that he loses. What kind of bet is this? So, so here is the theorem. OK, we already did part of the analysis. This is the procedure. The procedure is done. Now comes the analysis. First part of the analysis is <clears throat> the cost. Well, that's usually the second part of the analysis. So the first part of the analysis is the correctness. So analysis. Correctness and the second part is the cost. Now, we are already done with the second part. The cost is 1,400 bits of communication. And that's that. OK? So the first part is correctness. And since we are talking about a randomized algorithm, we do permit that the algorithm not be correct. So the output does not always have to be correct. The correctness analysis is really estimation of the error. So the theorem is that the probability, so for every x and y, the probability of error is less than 1 over 2 to the 500. OK? So let's look at the proof. <clears throat> OK, so case 1, x is equal to y. If x is, e if x is actually equal to y, then what is the probability of error? Raise your hand. Yes? It's 0. OK? In this case, Bob's answer 
is definitely correct. If x is equal to y, then x is congruent to y modulo the p prime p no matter what p l is uh, sent over to Bob. So there is no possibility of error. Case two is x is not equal to y. Now here there is a real possibility of error. It is possible that two numbers are not equal, but they are congruent modulo p, okay? So the case of error is when x is congruent to y modulo p, which is by definition, anybody recall the definition of congruence? Yes, I'd like to see more hands. What is it? Yes, Tim? So p is a divisor of x minus y, okay? So this is the divisor of. So p is a divisor of x minus y. If x is not equal to y, but p divides x minus y, that's a case when Bob will mistakenly declare x equals y, okay? So we have to estimate the probability of this happening. So what is the probability of error? All right, so first of all, I'd like to see what is the sample space for this experiment. So when we talk about probabilities, we talk about randomly choosing something out of a sample space. That's the set of all possible outcomes of the experiment. What is the sample space in this case? Yes? All possibilities for x across possibilities for y. No. Space of all primes with 700 digits, okay? So the sample space omega is all primes, okay? That's the only thing where we do random choice, okay? So x and y are set for us, they are given. The only random choice occurs when, the, when Alice chooses the prime number. So this is the space from which she chooses that prime number and she chooses them uniformly. Every prime has the same chance of being chosen. Okay, so we talk about a uniform probability space over exactly this space of choices. So therefore, the probability will have the size of this space in its denominator. Now, what is the size of this space? We have a notation for that, Corey. Pi. Right. Pi of 2 to the 700. So this is the number of primes that are less than or equal to 2 to the 700. All right, so that comes in the denominator, pi of 2 to the 700. And now we have to tell what is the numerator. The numerator, well, okay, so the case of error is that uh, we picked one of the prime divisors of x minus y, right? So uh, let's, let's uh, have this notation. Uh, nu of z is the number of distinct prime divisors of z, okay? This is the Greek letter nu. And in this case, <clears throat> I would write nu of x minus y here. And by doing this, I would be making a mistake, but in the right direction. So wh what, what, why, why did I write this, and why is it a mistake, and in what direction? OK, so the number of all cases is the denominator. The number of cases of error, that's the numerator, right? The number of all cases is all the primes in this range. The case of error is if, 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 one of those, if, if, if that prime happens to be one of the prime divisors of x minus y. So on the face of it, this should be correct, right? These are those primes that cause an error. Why is it nevertheless not quite right? Yes? I can't hear you. 
exactly. It is possible that x minus y being a humongous number, okay, it's not a 700 digit number, but a, a two to the 29 digit number, it can have prime divisors far greater than those that are counted in this range. So which way does an inequality go between these two? Less than or equal, right, okay? So the probability of error is less than or equal to this. The overcount is caused by possibility of very large prime numbers here, prime numbers that are out of that range, okay? Those numbers we can't possibly pick. So the actual number of bad cases here is less, less than or equal to the numerator here. But this is good enough for us. Let me continue this down here. <clears throat> okay, so first of all, we estimate the denominator. <clears throat> what do we know about pi of z? We have a, there is a great theorem that talks, that estimates the value of pi of z. So pi of z, which is the number of primes less than or equal to z. Yes, John? It's asymptotically z over natural log of z, right? Now, asymptotically equal means that they are within, um, say, epsilon percent of relative error. If z is large enough, uh, you take my word for that, that these numbers are large enough. They are, so they, so, uh, it's a pretty good estimate, and I, I write this. These are concrete numbers, so I can't write asymptotic equality because something must go to infinity when we talk about asymptotic equality. But this is approximately equal to, at least the denominator is approximately equal to 2 to the 700 divided by the natural log of 2 to the 700. Now what can I say about the numerator? I only want an upper bound on the numerator, and here is a trivial upper bound mu of z is less than or equal to the base 2 log of z. So if I look at the number of distinct prime divisors of an integer, even though I don't even have to be distinct, then that's at most the base 2 logarithm of z. Let's, let's quickly prove this. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, let's see. I guess I, I am raising a corner here. <clears throat> So that's a little lemma. Mu of z is less than or equal to base 2 log of z. Okay? All right, why? Because if mu of z is equal to k, that means that z is, can be written as p1 to the uh, r1 times etc. times pk to the rk, where the pi are primes. Right? So then this is greater than or equal to 2 times etc. times 2, which is 2 to the k. So z is greater than or equal to 2 to the k. So log base 2 of z is greater than or equal to k. And that's what we needed to prove. Okay? All right. So no number can have more than log base 2 of that number many uh, prime divisors. In fact, we didn't even use that they would be distinct. If we did, if we had used that they are distinct, we, could get, we would get another factor, a log-log factor dividing this. So, <clears throat> so what we can say definitely is that the numerator is less than or equal to the base two logarithm of x minus y. Now, x is a number with that many digits. Y is a number with that many digits. Then x minus y in absolute value is also a number with that many digits at most. And um, so let's see how many Okay, that's, that's 2.3 times, uh, okay, I want to, to do it in binary, so we had 2 to, to 2.3 times 10 to the 29, uh, there are 8 bits to a byte, so this many bits, so that's, uh, uh, I don't know, that's then less than 2 times 2 to the 30 as, uh, times 10 to the 30s rather. Uh, now 10 to the 30s is 2 to the 100, so 2 to the, times 2 to the 100. So that's 2 to the 101. So this is less than 2 to the 101 times this here, 
which is 700 times natural log of 2 divided by 2 to the 700. Okay? Now, natural log of 2 is less than 1, 700 is less than 1,000. So, <clears throat> 1,000 is, is about 2 to the 10. So, this here is less than 2 to the 111 divided by 2 to the 700, which is 1 over 2 to the 589. So, that's stronger than advertised. So once again, that, that's the upper bound on our error estimate. And of course, if you are not satisfied with 2 to the 500 in the denominator, you see that by adding another 1,000 bits of communication, we could increase this by 2 to the thousands. Yes? Yeah. Yes, I did. Okay. This is, okay, x minus y is an n digit number, right? Okay. n byte, that's 8 times n bits. Okay. So I'm counting here the bits. The bits is the base 2 logarithm, so that's 101. I, I'm sorry, 2 to the 101, right? Yeah. Okay. So it's a very big number. Its logarithm is 2 to the hundreds, right? But then 2 to the 7 hundreds beats it handsomely. Let's just see what the ingredients were of this spectacular improvement, okay? A change of model, okay? This is important. It shows that in some cases, randomization can be extremely powerful. Often, we just feel that it will be powerful. In this case, we were able to prove that it is extremely powerful. And the other thing was a little mathematics, okay? The notion of congruence is really not much more than that. Okay, we had to use the prime number theorem, but very weak estimates of the prime number theorem uh, that, that we could have had in discrete just by analyzing the binomial coefficients uh, for 20 minutes would have sufficed for this. So not a lot of mathematics, really, <clears throat> although the prime number theorem itself is one of the greatest theorems of mathematics all the time, of all time, but we didn't really need full force of that. Now, this was the first and last time when I was using concrete numbers. In this class, actually, the basic assumption will always be that there is a parameter n to our problems which goes to infinity, okay? My best approximation of infinity here was a very large number, right? But <clears throat> what we are interested in is not specific numbers that this algorithm requires that number of bits of communication or that amount of time or whatever, but what we are interested in, how does this value depend on n, which would be the size of the input measured by, uh, uh, by um, that would be part of, part of the definition of the model, how we measure the size of the input, okay? And, <clears throat> and that would go to infinity, and then we are interested in things like, okay, is this growing uh, polynomially or exponentially, maybe linearly, maybe sublinearly, maybe logarithmically, so that's the kind of things that we want to establish and, and we are looking for improvements by orders of magnitude and not by constant factors, even if constant factors are pretty large. Okay. <clears throat> so <clears throat> let me now give a second example <clears throat> of <clears throat> how An algorithmic technique can result in a surprising improvement of the performance of a procedure that we thought we already knew how to do. Okay? 
All right. <clears throat> so let's look at multiplication. of n digit integers. OK, <clears throat> how do we multiply n digit integers? Well, we write down one of them, we write down the other, OK? And then digit by digit, we multiply this by that, <clears throat> and in the end, we add them up. So. So we do a lot of digit multiplications and digit additions. How many do we do? How many digit multiplications does this require? Corey? Squared. N squared. OK. Now for the sake of examples, I'm going to do it on base 10. That again will be the only time we use base 10. Uh, um, and then and then I don't remember my multiplication tables, but I have a 10 by 10 multiplication table and I look it up, okay? And of course, one could do it by base, say, 1024 or whatever would be more appropriate for the particular computer setting, and then there would be much bigger tables where table lookup is needed. Uh, you remember about <coughs> the, the uh, uh, extremely successful campaign of Intel to put its own name on the computers which use their chips. They introduced this, this logo, Intel Inside. It was very successful, and then immediately there was a flawed chip. And, and so partly because of the logo, there was tremendous in incentive actually to test it, and some people who were working with very large prime numbers eventually found it, and then, then they communicated their experience over the internet and, and collectively actually uh, zoomed in on the error which was in the lookup table. So, uh, the multiplication on the chip was faulty. Um, <clears throat> so it's very interesting. This, is, this, is, this in itself is already apparently, uh, when, you, when you burn it into hardware, not necessarily a straightforward job. Um, but there was actually a theoretical flaw in it. So there was some, some sort of uh, overflow part where, 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 where somehow the lookup uh, was, was incorrect. So anyway, let's, let's suppose that we, we want to multiply these two n, uh, digit numbers and, and every lookup has unit cost. So that's our cost, okay? And in addition, we also have n squared, uh, or order of n squared digit additions, and we ignore that, okay? So, so the model is going to be this. The cost is unit, and the cost of this is zero. Why do we do this? Because this will be easier to handle somehow. <clears throat> and now, let's see how we can improve over this age-old algorithm. Well, how old? How old is this algorithm? The school, uh, the, the school book algorithm to multiply n digit numbers, I don't know, four digit numbers, five digit numbers, how, how old is that, historically? Yes? No? Okay. Roughly. Sumerians already knew. Hmm, that's an interesting statement because that would put it about 3,000 years before now, and I would, I would vehemently disagree with this statement. This algorithm depends on what kind of representation of the numbers. How did the Romans 2,000 years ago represent numbers? Okay? 2009 would be this, right? But 1,987, that would be a, a, a hell of a lot harder to write down, okay? So let's, let's write down 1,987. Okay, so that's 1,000, then this is 900, then this is 80, and then this is 7. Now multiply this by 3, okay? So in the Middle Ages, multiplication of numbers was part of university curriculum, okay? When did this change? 
what is the thing that changed this? That now eight years old can multiply four digit numbers. I'm sorry? Exactly. The, the, but the, the, the positional writing, okay? So, so <clears throat> right. Uh, Arabic numerals. And where do Arabic numerals come from? India, right. So, so when the Indian way of writing numbers, and, and the point is not so much that, okay, we have notation for the numerals, but we have notation that indicates the positions. And that's the positional notation, that was the key, and that permitted uh, 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 extreme simplification of calculations. Okay, so that's, that's uh, much less than 1,000 years old. Uh, okay, all right, but nev nevertheless, okay, it's many hundred years old, it's a well-established algorithm, and nobody would have thought until relatively recently that one could do better than n squared. But we can do better than n squared, and that's then the next subject. <clears throat> okay. So, <clears throat> okay, now when I say better than n squared, I mean much better than n squared. I would not care for an algorithm that does it in n squared over three, okay? So I'm not looking for a constant factor improvement. What I'm looking for is an order of magnitude improvement. So I am looking at an algorithm that only uses little o of n squared uh, steps, elementary steps which are now calculated in terms of, of bit multiplications, but we shall later also include additions. Okay, so we resort to an old Roman imperial tactic, which is called divide and conquer. Okay, before, before going to this application, let's, let's do a very simple example. So there is this game of 20 questions where I think of an object, okay, and you are supposed to guess what the object is, okay? So, um, um, uh, it's also called, called um, uh, what is it called, human, animal, mineral, or something like that, okay? So, so uh, okay, you, you, you somehow think of what kind of objects I could, I mean, such a simpleton like, like myself could have in their mind, and so you guess it's animal, okay? All right, then I say yes, it's animal, okay? And then you ask, uh, um, uh, is it a turtle? No, it's not a turtle. Now, of course, with that kind of guess, you could, you could, you could keep asking thousands of questions. I, I, I probably do know that many animals. So, so that's, that's the way a four-year-old would approach this, uh, as I recently experienced, okay? Is it turtle? No, it's not turtle. Is it elephant? Yes, it's elephant. Okay, good. Two questions, guess, <laughs> guess right. Uh, uh, so, okay, so that's not really the best strategy. What is the best strategy? What does that mean? A question should be yes or, a question has to be yes or no question, so you. You are not given a three. Okay, suppose you have some idea of all the possible objects that I could think of, then what should your question aim at? The, I'm sorry? Okay, let's go to mathematics. So here is, here are, I don't know, capital N objects. I tell you in advance, okay? These are the only possible objects I can think of. Then what should be your strategy? Maya? Half, okay, half it, okay? Your question should ask, okay, is the object in the left half? And then the yes or no halves the number of, possible, of possibilities. If you are able to really halve it, okay? For that, uh, you would need full knowledge of what, uh, what uh, objects I may have in mind. Then how many questions would zoom in on the particular object I actually had in mind? Yes? Log base two of n, right. Log base two of n questions suffice, right. So 
So if you are somehow guaranteed that 20 questions against me are always sufficient, what does that tell my, about my brain capacity? Corey? So fewer than two to the 20th, yes. So that's roughly a million. So that's how many objects I could have. Okay, I mean, that's something. Uh, but uh, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so that's, uh, that's this. Okay, so in order to achieve such logarithmic uh, rate of zooming in, we need to be able to at least if not half, but approximately half. I mean, divide. if I divide it in one third, two thirds, then it, it, it can go down by rate of two thirds, which is still logarithmic, not to the base 10, uh, not to the base two, but to the base of three halves, which is a little bit, gives bigger numbers, but it's still logarithmic, okay? So if I can always split it into a constant fraction, that's sort of good, all right? Okay, good. So that's the basic idea of divide and conquer. And now let's see how that could possibly be applied to the multiplication of n-digit numbers. Well, all right. So here I have an n-digit number, which I call x, another n-digit number, which I call y. I split it into two. So that's x1 and that's x2. So x is ca can be written as, as these are n-digit numbers. So uh, x1 times 10 to the n over 2 plus x2, right? I split it. So I have now two numbers with half the number of digits and same, same thing with y, y1 plus times 10 to the n over 2 plus y2, okay? All right, so I split them. Now I multiply these split up numbers. So xy is equal to x1 y1 times 10 to the n plus x1 y2 plus x2 y1 times 10 to the n over 2 plus x2 y2, okay? All right, so what is going to be my Algorithm, well, I reduce the problem of multiplying n digit numbers to multiplying n over two digit numbers. That's sort of a good reduction, okay? I mean, as long as n is greater than one, I can keep going down. When I am down to one digit numbers, then of course I use my lookup table. So, <clears throat> all right, so this is a, what kind of algorithm would this be then? What's the term for? When I reduce bigger cases to smaller cases, Taiwan. Oh, I'm sorry. No. Recursive. This is a recursive algorithm. Okay. So a recursive algorithm calls itself on smaller instances. So I am defining a procedure of how to multiply n-digit numbers. And inside the procedure, I want to multiply n over two digit procedures, uh, n over two digit numbers. Well, the way I multiply them is by what procedure? How am I going to multiply the half size numbers? Using the same procedure. So I'm not using the textbook procedure. I'm using this same procedure, okay, all the way down to two digits, when I am down to one digit, then I look it up. Okay, so it bottoms out at the place when there, are, when there is only one digit. Okay, so let's see what the complexity of this is. So let's say, that, let's call M of N be the number of digit multiplications required by this method. On n digit integers. Okay? All right, so what do we get here? We reduce the multiplication of two n digit numbers to how many multiplications of n over two digit numbers? Puya? Four. Okay, so then the cost is at most four times the cost of multiplying n over two digit numbers. So we got a recurrent inequality. Okay, in order to do the n digit number, we have to do four instances of that same problem on n over two digit numbers. 
So the question is what is, what is then the solution of this? Well, um, okay, so it is not difficult to see and I don't want to give here an, an, an exact derivation, but if we look, well, what we look is, okay, we are up against n squared, right? So we are looking at something of the form n to the alpha. Hopefully alpha is going to be less than two, right? So suppose this has an n to the alpha type solution, n to the alpha, and let's, let's make it equal really, okay? And this would be four times n over two to the alpha. So what is alpha? Let's just see. Okay, so this, is, this says n to the alpha equals four times n to the alpha over two to the alpha. The n to the alpha part cancels, two to the alpha is four, alpha is equal to two. That's sort of disappointing. This means that this method gives us no improvement over, uh, over uh, the textbook method. It still requires quadratic number. Uh, so why did I bring it up at all? Well, the problem is if we don't put in an idea, then no improvement is going to come out, right? And the idea is still missing. Well, okay. The idea is that instead of this inequality, we are going to do with only three. We don't really need these four multiplications. Well, out of them, we certainly need this and we need this, but here we only need the sum of the two. How could we, using just one more multiplication of n over two digit numbers, actually get hold of this number? So suppose we already computed this and we computed this. And now we are left with one more multiplication. Remember, additions, subtractions are free, so we can do that. That is permitted. But only one more multiplication, and we want to get the value of that number. Jion? X1 plus X2, that could have one more digit, and I would prefer then X1 minus X2 times Y1 minus Y2. Let's see what this is. This is X1, y, X1, Y1. That has already been computed. Plus X2, Y2, that has already been computed. Minus, and here comes, here comes our magic expression, X1, Y2 plus X2, Y1. Okay, so by computing this difference, this difference, and doing one single multiplication, and the number of digits did not increase, okay, then knowing this value, and we already know these two values, another couple of subtractions gives us the value that we seek. So the total number of multiplications we did was only three. Okay, all right. So then we have now this inequality and now let's solve it in terms of something like n to the alpha. So n to the alpha is let's say equal three times m, oops, n over two to the alpha. And so that means that uh, just as before two to the alpha is now not two but, uh, not four but three. So alpha is the base two logarithm of three, which is roughly one point, anybody a calculator? I didn't check it, but I think it is roughly 1.68. So, um, if I am not mistaken, uh, so we got a tremendous gain in the exponent. Instead of doing it in n squared, now we did it in n to the base two log of three. You might think, aha, but there was a price to pay here because we reduced the number of multiplications at the cost of an increased number of additions, okay? But 
thinking about it again, the number of additions we do is proportional to the number of multiplications. Well, it's not the same number, but it is maybe six times that number. Oh, but that doesn't influence the order of magnitude. So in fact, the order of magnitude of the number of additions also went down similarly. We are going to make this, this argument was not precise, but we are going to make this intuition precise the next time. That illustrates the point now that using this unrealistic uh, simplification in the model that the cost of additions is zero permitted us to focus on what's really essential. We reduce that, and then we are able to pull it back and, and, and actually get a reduction even in the cost of the thing that we just ignored. Okay? So homework is going to be posted on the website this afternoon. So please check it and, uh, and uh, <clears throat> send me any questions. And most importantly, if you find anything that looks like it's in error on the website, then send me email. You will get homework uh, bonus points if, uh, if I find that that was really an important uh, uh, error that, that you noticed. Okay? So thank you. <clears throat>